I've titled today's message, Reason to Live a Holy Life. Going back just a bit, um, Paul had just received an encouraging report from Timothy about how things are going in the Thessalonian church. It really pumped him up. He was really excited about it. And it was uh, at the end here, he mentions that he's excited. He really wants to, to see them, to be with them. And now as we continue on, as he continues on with the last part of this section here, um, we're going to see that he offers a prayer for them. A prayer that not only summarizes what he said up to this point of the letter, but will also foreshadow the major themes that he'll touch on when he gets to chapter 4 which will primarily be on proper Christian ethical conduct or holiness. Now, for again, for us reading it, for us going through it, after we get through the section of his prayer, when we get into the first part of chapter 4, Paul is going to be showing us several reasons why, as believers, we ought to reasons to live a holy life. As many of you know, we're called to live holy lives. And I know that a lot of people are wondering, well, how can we do that? How can we live holy lives when we're sinful people? We can't be, you know, we're not Jesus. And you're not. You're right, you're not. I'm not Jesus. But we can certainly live like him. We can live our lives like Him, but that takes a work, of the, a work of God. And so again, here in that second, in that first part of chapter 4, He's going to show us reasons to live a holy life. So before I get into the last part of chapter 3, let's pray and ask God to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful that You have us out here we are thankful for those that are watching this live, that are hearing this message later on, um, or maybe even watching it, Lord. I pray that you will bless them, encourage them, and show them great and wonderful things, Lord. I pray that you will um, do your work. Your spirit will go out and, and, and convict hearts, transform lives. We pray that, again, this message will also encourage those that are here. For everyone here, we all do. We all need encouragement. We all need wisdom, and your word offers that. We know that we believe that. So be with us now. Lord, fill this room with your spirit and remove all distractions. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. The Word of God says, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. May you make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Now, as I mentioned, right before this prayer starts, Paul had already mentioned in verse 10 two things that he was praying for. One, to see them again, and two, to help bring their faith to maturity. Well, here now, we can actually see a written example of a type of prayer that he prayed. Written in the form of a wish. In these three verses, Paul prayed for three specific requests. He first prays that God and God and 
uh, God the Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Here, God was the object of his prayer and is referred to as the father of Paul, his companions, and the Thessalonian believers. Now, with the same breath, the Lord Jesus is also addressed equally in prayer with the Father. Now, by saying this, by saying it in this manner, Paul is connecting the two, indicating the unity of both, and also implying that Jesus is God. This is highlighted by Paul's use of the singular verb with a plural subject, which could also be read as, may he direct our way. So in conjunction with verse 10, the request is that God will clear the way to Thessalonica in order to see the believers and encourage their faith so that they will mature in their faith. Timothy's report about the Thessalonians' faith encouraged Paul and fueled his prayer to be reunited with them without any hindrance. Paul's second prayer was that the Lord will cause you, the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another. Times of suffering can be times of selfishness. Persecuted people often become very self-centered and demanding. See, what life does to us depends on what life finds in us. And nothing reveals the true inner man like the furnace of affliction. Some people build walls in times of trial and shut themselves off. Others, though, build bridges and draw closer to the Lord and his people. And so as their pastor, Paul wanted them to draw near to God so that his love will overflow in such a way that's, that it's expressed with love towards each other. In fact, Jesus also spoke of the essential place love has in identifying the mark of Christians. In John 13, 5, he said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The Apostle John also emphasized this principle in 1 John 4, verse 20. There he wrote, If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So in the midst of severe persecution, Paul hoped that the Thessalonian believers would look outward, in love, instead of inward, in selfishness. Sometimes, sometimes, these lessons can only be learned in the school of suffering. For example, you guys, are you guys familiar with the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph suffered 13 years because of his brothers. His brothers' envy and persecution Yet he learned to love them in spite of their hatred. And there's several other examples throughout the Bible. And so perhaps, just maybe, that's what the Lord wants you to wants to teach you in the storm of your trial. To look outward in love. You see. True love deep deepens in times of difficulty. 
In those times, God wants to pour his love on you so that you will pour it out on others. So when trial and disappointments come, instead of saying, poor me, you'll find yourself saying, God, pour me. Pour into me so that I may love others. Pour your love into me so that I may love others, so that I may love my brother and sister in Christ. Now, this overflowing love shouldn't only be shown just to believers. But what does he say there also? should also be shown toward everyone. Yes, we love one another, but we also must love the lost and our enemies. In the New King James Version, verse 12 says, Abound in love. Now I'm pointing this out because abounding in love must not be bound. It must be free to expand and touch everyone. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 46 and 47, Jesus told us that our love is small and shallow if we only love those who also love us. So as a Christian, when you display love towards unbelievers, towards your enemies, towards the lost, you're being just like your heavenly Father who is merciful even to evil people. But also, love those that may not love you in return. By loving those who may not love you in return, it it not only testifies of the overflow of God's love in your life, because, again, it's His love. But also, what it also does, it, it'll, He gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. Now, at the end of verse 12, we see that this was the love that He and His companions modeled when they were in Thessalonica. And that same love is what made them come before the Lord in prayer, made them come before the Lord in prayer and ask the believers there to have the same love that he had for them. Now, I'm going to share something and be honest with you, transparent. There have been times in my own walk when I've found myself thinking, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm doing pretty good as a believer. Doing good. But I've learned that if I don't check myself. If I don't check those thoughts, I'll begin to get comfortable. And I'll start to get complacent. And the more that goes on, eventually apathy begins to creep into my heart. And so when I read these verses, the Spirit says to me, I want you to increase. I rejoice in what's happening in your life but may your love for me grow to an ever-deepening measure. Paul's third request in verse 13 was for God to make uh, Christian hearts blameless in holiness. Blameless in holiness. Notice, though, that it is the return of Jesus Christ that motivates the believer to live a holy life. Lord's return is also a stability in the Christian life. Where there's stability, there can be sanctity. And where there's holiness, there's assurance. The two, my friends, go together. Let me repeat that. Where there's stability, there's sanctity. And where there's holiness, there's assurance. Those two, they go together intertwined. If you read this prayer carefully, the entire Trinity is involved. Paul addressed the Father and Son in verse 11. The Lord in verse 12 may also refer 
to the Holy Spirit. And our Lord, at the end of verse 13, certainly refers to Jesus Christ. If this is so, then, then this is the only prayer that I see, that I know in the, in the New Testament, directed to the Holy Spirit. The Bible. The Bible's pattern of prayer is to the Father. Listen carefully. To the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. To the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. So if you want help learning how to pray, follow that pattern. To the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. Since the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier of the believer, and this is a prayer for holy living, the address is proper. Now, Paul ended chapter 2 with a reference to the place of the saints and the return of Christ. And he ended this chapter in the same way. He prayed that his converts might stand, stand blameless and holy before, Christ, or before God at Christ's return. Now, since all believers will be transformed to be like Christ when He returns, Paul could not be referring to our personal condition in heaven. Thus, it seems that he was referring to our lives here on earth as they will be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ. See, we will never face our sins in heaven, for they are remembered against us no more according to Romans chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. But our works will be tested. And you cannot separate conduct from character. You can't. You can't separate the two. We talked about conduct or we talked about character a few weeks ago. So Paul's prayer teaches us how to pray, not only for new believers, but for all believers we should pray that their faith will mature, their love grow, and their character and conduct be holy and blameless before God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians emphasized three things that, are, that I think are important for all of us as Christians today. First, he wanted to be with them so they could benefit from his apostolic wisdom and authority. He wanted them to abound in love. And he wanted them to be established in true heart holiness. All right, so that's the prayer. As I said in the beginning, this prayer closes out the first section of this letter, but it also introduces one of the greatest themes of the second part of this letter, the coming of our Lord. Additionally, the second part, Paul will record practical instructions and exhortations to proper behavior in view of the truth. Now, the first part of chapter 4, concerns three aspects of proper Christian living. One general on conduct, and two specific about sexual purity and brotherly love. <clears throat> Today, because of the time, we're only going to cover the first two, and next week we'll cover the third. So now turn with me to chapter 4, and let's read. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God as you're doing, do this even more. For you know what command we gave you through the Lord Jesus. 
for this is God's will, your sanctification. That you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with the lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses, as we also previously told and warned you. For God, does not call, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, any one of you who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who gives you His Holy Spirit. The moral, at the time, the moral climate of the Roman Empire wasn't healthy as maybe it is on, in our current day and age. Immorality was a way of life. The Christian message of holy living was new to that culture. And it wasn't easy for these young believers to fight the temptations all around them. Well, here, Paul gave four reasons why they should live a holy life and abstain from sensual lusts. The first reason is found in verse 1. The first reason to live a holy life is to please God. Everybody, everybody lives to please somebody. Many people live to please themselves. They have no sensitivity to the needs of others. Someone once wrote, the soul of a journey is liberty, perfect liberty, to think, feel, and do just as one pleases. Now that advice may work for a vacation, but it can never work for the everyday affairs of life. Christians cannot go through life pleasing only themselves. Now, we must also be careful when it comes to pleasing others. It's possible to, bo- it's possible to both please others and honor God, but it's also possible to dishonor God. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, For am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still try, trying to, stru- to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. This here, that verse there, although it said to the Galatian church, this was also the attitude of Paul when he ministered in Thessalonica. He wasn't trying to please people. He was trying to be a servant of Christ. Pleasing God ought to be the major motive of the Christian life. As children of God, we ought to live to please our Heavenly Father. As the Holy Spirit works in our lives, He helps us to both to both to will and to do his good pleasure. You also remember the story of Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and before God called him to heaven, Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Speaking of God the Father, Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 29. I always do what pleases Him. Pleasing God means much more than simply doing God's will. See, it's also impossible, or it's also possible to obey God and yet not please Him. Jonah, here's a case in point. He obeyed God and he did do what he was commanded, but his heart wasn't in it. God blessed his word, but he could not bless 
his servant. So Jonah sat outside the city of Nineveh, angry with everyone, including the Lord. And so how can you all know? How can you all know what pleases God? Well, it's the same way. It's the same thing, the same way you know what pleases an earthly father by listening to him and living with him. As we read the word and as we fellowship in worship and service, we get to know the heart of God. And this, by doing that, opens us up to the will of God. In verses 2 and 3, we see the second reason to live a holy life, to obey God. When he ministered in Thessalonica, Paul gave the believers the commandments of God regarding personal purity. The word commandments is a military term. It refers to orders handed down from a superior officer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are soldiers in God's army, and we must obey orders. In the NIV, in the NIV 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. So in verse 3, Paul reminded these new believers that sexual immorality doesn't please God. God, my friends, and let me read, I'm sure you've heard this before, but God created sex. God created sex, and he has the authority to govern its use. From the beginning, when he created man and woman, he established marriage as a sacred union between one man and one woman. That's what God ordained. That's what he established since the beginning. That's the way he did it. And we have to remember, God doesn't change. He's the same God that he was then as he is now. God created sex for both the continuance of the human race, for procreation, and also for the pleasure between a man, a wife, and a husband. A wife and a husband in marriage. One wife and one husband. God's commands concerning sex aren't for the purpose of robbing people of joy, but rather of protecting them that they might not lose their joy. The command, you will not commit adultery, builds a wall around marriage and makes the relationship not a prison, but a safe and beautiful garden. A safe and beautiful garden. We never have to seek to know the will of God in this matter. He has told us clearly. He has made it already known. Abstain from fornication is his commandment. And no amount of liberal theology, modern philosophy, or cultural war wokeness can alter that. Throughout the Bible, God warns against sexual sin, and these warnings must be heeded. So why again? What's the purpose of sexual purity? Well, the purpose is our sanctification. What does that mean? Live separated. We might live separated lives in purity of mind and purity of body. 
You see, he wants, to be, he wants us to be set apart from the godless culture and its sexual immorality. See, believer, Christian, if our sexual behavior is no different than that of the Gentiles or unbelievers, uncircumcised, who don't know God, then we're not sanctified, set apart in the way that God wants us to be. Verses 4 and 5 tells us the third reason to live a holy life, to glorify God. This is the positive side of God's commandment. Christians are supposed to be different from the unsaved. If you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself, if you consider yourself a born-again Christian, you're supposed to be completely different than those who are not. The Gentiles or the unsaved, that's what he means by using that word, who do not know God. They live ungodly lives. But we, as believers, as followers of Christ, we're obligated, obligated to glorify Him in this world. Ask yourself that question. Are you glorifying Him while you're living in this world? Wherever you may be, at work, at school, at your jobs, at gatherings with family or friends, are you living a life that glorifies Him? See, God's plan is to make you holy. And that entails first, first of all, a clean break from sexual immorality. In, in verse 4, Paul writes that phrase, control his own body. By saying that, he's implying that our bodies are vessels of God. Now, some interpretations or some scholars or commentaries may say that it also means to learn to live with his own life or his own wife. For the wife is called the weaker vessel. There in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But I personally prefer that first interpretation. Why? Because Paul was writing to all Christians, not just the married ones. And so, the Christian who commits sexual sin, again, you call yourself a Christian, you commit sexual sin, is sinning against his own body. And he's also, or he or she, is also robbing God of the glory he should receive through a, believer, a believer's way of life. This explains why God gives such demanding requirements for spiritual leadership here in the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If spiritual leaders cannot rule their own homes, how can they lead the church? But if we glorify God in our bodies, then we can glorify Him in the body, which is the church. Now, let me also add again that God has called the men the husband, to be the spiritual leader of their homes. And so if that man, if that husband cannot control their own desires and passions, control their own bodies, they're not going to be able to lead in their home. They're not going to be able to be those spiritual leaders. They can play the part they can pretend, but they won't be able to truly lead in the way God intended. 
as husbands, as men, it's important to glorify God in your body. When you do that, you will be able to glorify God in the home. Finally, in verses 6 through 8, Paul tells us the fourth, the fourth reason to live a holy life. It's a big one. To escape the judgment of God. Colossians chapter 3 informs us that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, He doesn't care who you are, where you come from, what, you've, what your background is, what your race is, what your... You know, what your income is, for him, it does, all that doesn't matter. He must deal with his children when they sin. While it's true that the Christian isn't under, isn't, isn't under condemnation, it's also true that they're free from the harvest of sorrow it's also true that they're not free from the harvest of sor sorrow that comes when we give in to the flesh. When King David committed adultery, he tried to cover up his sin, but God chastened him severely. When David confessed his sins, God forgave him. But what happened? He couldn't change, but God couldn't, God couldn't change the consequences. See, David reaped what he sowed, and it was, an, it was a painful experience for him. And you may be saying, but I'm one of God's elect. I belong to him, and he can never cast me out. Friends, election... Being a believer, being born again, isn't an excuse for sin. It's an encouragement for holiness. It says there again in verse 7, For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Now, add that to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, As the one who called you is holy, you also be holy. So you see, the privilege of election also involves responsibilities and obedience. A holy walk involves a right relationship with God the Father, who has called us, God the Son, who died for us, and God the Spirit, who lives in us. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes our body, your body, the temple of God. Furthermore, it's by walking in the Spirit that we get victory over the lusts of the flesh. To despise God's commandments is to invite judgment, to invite the judgment of God and to grieve the Spirit of God. So how then does the Spirit help us live a clean life, free from sexual impurity? Well, to begin with, He creates holy desires within us so that we have an appetite for the pure and holy Word of God. And also to not be polluted by the garbage of the world that wants to tempt our flesh. Also, he teaches us the word. Again, I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit. He teaches us his word and helps us to remember God's promises in times of temptation. And I was, as we yield to the Spirit, he empowers us to walk in holiness and not be detoured by the lusts of the world and the flesh. It says in, well, we're told in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, and I'm paraphrasing here, the fruit of the Spirit 
overcomes the works of the flesh. As we see, Paul devoted a great deal of space to this theme of sexual purity because the big, it was a critical problem in the church of that day. But it's also a big problem, a critical problem in the church right now, in our modern day. For many, marriage vows are no longer considered sacred. They're no longer considered holy. When people give those wedding, those vows at, the, at their weddings, they forget that giving those vows in the presence of witnesses and in the presence of God. And also, divorce, even among the believers, is no longer governed by the Word of God. They no longer consider what it says about marriage. Also, consider what's going on also in many churches and denominations today. There are gay churches where homosexuals and lesbians and transsexuals, where they preach and talk about loving one another, and then they also claim to be Christians, and yet they forget that that behavior is sinful. Premarital sex. And I know this sounds weird, but there is such a thing. Christian pornography are accepted parts of the religious landscape in many places. Yet, God has called believers to walk in holiness. Now, I mentioned a lot of, a lot of things here. What if you failed? What if you feel you failed? Or keep failing to walk in holiness? Well, let me share something else with you. Every church, every church, including this one, is packed with sinners. Because every, at every point, because every one of us has had one, at one point or another failed in our lives. When we fail in those times, when we do fail as believers, here's what we're to say. We're to come to God and say this, I failed, Father, but I confess my sin and turn from it. Use the scars of repercussions I know are sure to follow and draw others to your grace and forgiveness. Friends, it was the wounds of Jesus bore for our sin that convinced Thomas the reality of, it, of his resurrection. So too, the scars of our sin can witness to the reality of his grace in our lives. These eight verses that we covered, Paul told us why people need to submit themselves to God's authority by trusting in Christ. And the Spirit will enable him to walk in a manner that's pleasing to God. While the Thessalonians are commanded to live holy lives, God is the one who will enable them to be holy. Therefore, those who don't, hear, who don't heed Paul's instruction about immorality shows that they haven't experienced the inward work of the Spirit and reject the God who gives that spirit. At the very least, they should have no assurance that they're truly counted among God's people. Conversely, though, Paul encourages his readers, and he also encourages us 
reading this letter, to persevere by demonstrating the fruits of sanctification, which results in satisfying God. And so in this light, the main point of these verses is still on pleasing God. And we also learned here reasons to live a holy life. In reverse order, again, those are to escape the judgment of God, to glorify God, to obey God, and to please God. So as I close now, maybe again some of you have feel, have feel like you've failed, that you've fallen short, that you've messed up really bad. You've made compromises. Maybe again you've started down the dangerous path of sexual immorality. Again, behaviors that don't please the Lord. You feel that conviction in your heart. You feel the Lord telling you, the Holy Spirit telling you, that's not right. Child, I want what's best for you, and what you're doing isn't best for you. But that conviction is good, and I tell you, if that's you, it's never too late to turn back to him, to ask for forgiveness, and to repent of your sins, to to return back to Christ. If you're feeling the pressures from friends or from a relationship or whatever, and those friends aren't believers, and you consider yourself a Christian, a believer, and they're pressuring you to be involved in some of the same behaviors as they are, Set yourself apart. Have that conviction within you that take a stand. Say, no, I'm going to honor God. This body is a temple. And I'm I'm going to honor God with this temple. Holy Spirit lives in me, and I don't want to grieve him. So my, I'm going to honor the Lord by honoring this temple he's giving me. I'm not going to defile it. I'm not going to just allow anyone to come in and try to destroy it. It's a person out there. The Lord has chosen for you. And I'm speaking to the single people here, those who aren't married. A person out there that God has chosen. And I know that you've been praying about that person. You've been praying for that person. One day he's going to reveal it. Or maybe he has, the Lord has revealed it, revealed that person to you. If he respects and loves you and wants to honor the Lord, he's going to wait. He or she, I should say she too, is not going to pressure you, especially if they're a believer, especially if they tell you they're sitting next to you in church and they tell you that they also... Um, have Jesus in their heart, they're not going to pressure you. Just as they will want to live a holy life and and honor God with their bodies, they're going to respect you and want to honor you and your decision to honor the Lord with your body. When you finally stand there on your wedding day, you will see, you will... You will say those marriage vows 
and they're going to be meaningful. They're going to hold a lot of weight. But it's a continual thing, even through marriage, throughout the entire marriage. And if you are married, if you are in the bound, or like in, in marriage, that's the person that God has chosen for you. That's the person that you prayed for. And so honor them. Honor them by doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Honor them with your body. Honor them with what you're involved in. Don't go out and look for things or or people that are going to dishonor those vows. All right. If you feel again that you've failed and have never known the Lord and want to have a life that's pleasing to God, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you there to the cross where you can lay all your sins before Him, before Jesus, and He will forgive you. He died for you. He died for all those things that you've done. And He will set you free. Just come to Him with an open heart. Come to Him and He will forgive you. So if that's you, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I now truly believe that you died for my sins and three days later rose from the dead. So now I turn for my sins. I repent and confess you as my one and only personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And thank you for saving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. And, that, and so that he may also help me to love others that maybe may not love me in return. Thank you. In your name, amen. If you pray that, reach out to us. We want to hear how uh, God or the Holy Spirit led you to this video to Pray that prayer. If you're going through a hard time, also reach out to us. We want to pray with you. We want to maybe help you also in your next steps of your Christian walk. For those watching and listening, thank you for joining us. I hope that you'll join us next week as we continue uh, this chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I hope that you have a great and amazing and blessed week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.